The meaning of occultism. A summary and some explanation of the principal forms of occultism must precede the chapters which deal with the historical side of this subject, and the objections, those of the credulous as well as those of the skeptics, must be foreseen and forestalled. Many persons are tempted to deny, arbitrarily and without examination, statements on matters of which they have no previous knowledge, but even the possible criticism of such as these must have received due consideration. In this age of wireless and aeroplanes, one of the fads of the modern highbrow is to scoff at such things as sorcerers, magic and evocations as old wives' tales. Tales of ancient history. There are people who refuse to believe in the existence of the supernatural, perhaps we should say supernormal, even when confronted with the evidence. Sushari the skeptics who deny everything. Hide bound in their prejudice, they ignore the fact that magic, white or black, has no as many adepts as ever, nor can they distinguish between th different schools of spiritism. First, there are the charlatans whose tricks in the line of spiritism are generally sooner or later unmasked. There are the occultists who operate in secrecy and hide their meetings from all but initiates with the greatest care. Many persons are duped by charlatans. So the skeptics persuade themselves of the absolute non-existence of all diabolical practices in modern times. They are wrong. For occultism flourishes now in Europe, Asia, and America. The Black Mass is said today in Paris and London, and Satanism is its faithful followers. On this subject one of the most eminent writers was Karl Hacks, who, under the pseudonym of Dr. Butai, made an extensive study of occultism and gave his extremely exaggerated views of it in the book La Diabolkoshksiekla. The following pages of this chapter are mostly either quotations or abridgments from that work, according to the teaching of the Christian churches, God allows demons certain limited powers, but they are not permitted to open the gates of hell and release a spirit at their request of one who evokes the dead. The dead, even damned, will not show themselves if evoked nor would evocations be answered by those who had succeeded in attaining the kingdom of heaven, but devils can and do, says the church, substitute themselves for the deceased. They will impersonate a dead person whose appearance is demanded by invocations. It is also admitted that the fallen angels or spirits will often manifest to people without being called, the theological geographers cite many cases of diabolical apparitions to saints, apparitions which these saints have been able to repel and conquer. But what skeptics and agnostic Christians allocanure is that besides the drawing room mediums, mediums for diversion, there are occultists whose vile practices are, veiled in the profoundest mystery. These men, whose morale sense is absolutely perverted, believe in Lucifer, but they believe him to be the equal of God and worship him secretly. Modern occultism is on the one hand practical Kabbalah and all the other, Indian yogism, both of which have always hot your adepts more or less openly. The Kabbalah is occult science itself. It is the secret theology of the initiates, theology essentially satanic. In a word the counter theology. Our God, the God of the Christians, is the power of evil in the eyes of the Kabbalists, and for them the power of good, the real God, is Lucifer. The Kabbalah teaches magic or the art of intercourse with spirits and supernatural beings. One cannot be a convinced Kabbalist without soon becoming a magician and devoting oneself to the practices of occultism. Not that our Kabbalists or contemporary magicians practice all the different branches of occultism. Some of these have been abandoned and others are only used by charlatans for the exploitation of superstitious persons, but a great many, precisely the most criminal and perverse, are observed in the hidden dens of our modern Luciferians. Two magic has two divisions the first is divining magic, subdivided into several branches of which the principal are, astrology, aromancy, palmistry, hydromancy, anthropomancy, pyromancy, one ira critics. Cardomancy, the second is operative magic, also subdivided into several branches of which the principal are, alchemy necromancy mesmerism theurgy various miraculous feats there are moreover some superstitious practices not specially classed. But I thus defines some of the foregoing, astrology. Divining the future by the stars. The casting off horoscopes is its most prevalent practice. Paul mystery. Divining the future by the hand. Anthropomancy. This is one of the practices supposed at present to have fallen into disuse. 
It is a horrible, savage abomination and consists in disemboweling a human being for the purpose of divining the future by inspection of the entrails. Medieval history accuses Gilles de Retz of perpetrating these crime on children, whom he lured to his castle for the purpose. Tacitus says that the Druids, in ancient Britain, use it to consult their gods by looking into the entrails of their captives. One ira critics. Divining the future through interpretation of dreams. Aromancy. Divination by the study of aerial phenomena. Hydromancy. Divination by the study of liquids or aquatic phenomena. Pyromancy. Divination by fire. Cardomancy. Divination by cards. There is no need to expatiate further on the more or less grotesque means employed by those who follow these false sciences. One must be somewhat erratic to imagine that the future can be foretold by coffee grounds, by the antics of flames in a grate, by the order in which shuffled cards will be drawn, or by the odd shapes assumed by wind-driven clouds. When events corroborate predictions made under these conditions, it can be attributed to the use of the power of clairvoyance, but these fortune-tellers, some of whom have a thorough knowledge of the rules governing the practices of these absurdities, are the first to distrust their art. Such expedients, disdained by the real occultists, are too unimportant to be worthy of note. It is quite another matter to expose the Satanists, ignored by the public, whose sects, bearing different names in different countries, constitute, in reality, only one, single, secret religion whose fanatics, imbued with the spirit of evil, will sacrifice themselves blindly to their cause. Throughout the universe, all Luciferian and Satanic rites bear a basic similarity. Dealing principally with the practices of contemporary operative magic, it is Bataille's opinion that as regards the mysterious art of alchemy, its theory is called hermetic science and has a double objective, namely, the discovery of philosopher's stone, a substance capable of transmuting base metals into gold and drinkable gold, or the elixir of long life which is a magic potion endowed with the properties necessary to prolong human life indefinitely or, at least, to maintain in old age the faculties of youth. Alchemy as a science seems now obsolete. The alchemists knew the existence of microbes and toxins long before the medical discoveries of the present age. The laboratories of satanic bacteriology have been working, for a long time, on cultures of bacilli or solutions of their toxic properties, which, even when administered in infinitesimal doses, mixed with food or drink, disseminate disease and death where it is judged necessary by the masters that life is to be destroyed. In these cases, deaths occur from apparently natural causes. He further says that magnetic mesmerism is the occult medicine of the Kabbalists. One must naturally not confuse the scientists who are at present making researches in hypnotism and suggestion, in the interest of science, with the emulator of Cagliostro whose aim is to procure diversions, often it's and immoral. Scientific magnetism is still an obscure question being studied by theologians, physiologists and criminologists, whereas that of the adepts of magic has nothing to do with this. It is a branch of the subterranean work that is nearing its goal today. Necromancy is partly divining magic and partly operative magic. This practice consists in the evocation of the spirits of dead. Spiritism and wrapping up tables are necromancy. Beautiful spiritists are not necessarily Kabbalists, all Kabbalists are a practicing necromancy. People are far from suspecting the progress made by necromancy along these lines. Freemasonry is yearly more and more invaded by the spiritist element to the extent that, in 1889, an international convention of spiritist Freemasons attended by about 500 delegates was held at the Hotel of the Grand Orient of France, Rue Cadet, Paris. This was only a beginning. Three Eliphas Levi, a renowned occultist of the 19th century, writing in East War de la Magui, four in the following words, sounds a warning to those who, recklessly, would venture into the domain of the occult. The experiences of theurgy and necromancy are always disastrous to those who indulge in them. When one has once stood on the threshold of the other world one must be and almost invariably under terrible conditions. Fierce giddiness then catalepsy followed by madness. It is true that the atmosphere is disturbed, the woodwork cracks and doors tremble and groan in the presence of certain persons, after a series of intoxicating acts. Weird sounds, sometimes bloody signs, will appear spontaneously on paper or linen. 
they are always the same and are classed by magicians as diabolical writings. The very sight of them induces a state of convulsion or ecstasy in the mediums who believe themselves to be seen spirits. Thus Satan, the spirit of evil, is transfigured for them into an angel of light but, before they will manifest, these so-called spirits require sympathetic excitement produced by sexual intercourse on the part of their devotees. Hands must be placed in hands, feet on feet, they must breathe in each other's faces, these acts often being followed by others of an obscene character. The initiates, reveling in these forms of excesses believe themselves to be the elect of God and the arbiters of destiny. They are the successors of the fakirs of India. No warning will save them. To cure such illnesses, the priests of Greece used to terrify their patients by concentration and exaggeration of thievil in one great paroxysm. They made the adept sleep in the cave of Trophonius. After some preliminary preparations, he descended to a subterranean cavern in which he was left without light soon to be prostrated by intoxicating gases. Then the visionary, still in the throes of ghastly dreams caused by incipient asphyxia, was rescued, being carried off prophesying on his tripod. These tests gave their nervous systems such a shock that the patients never dared mention evocations of phantoms again. Theurgy is the highest degree of occultism. Necromancy is limited to the summoning of dead souls, but the theurgists of the 19th century evoke entities qualified by the Maes Genii, angels of light, exalted spirits, spirits of fire etc. in their meetings, scattered throughout the world, they worship Lucifer. The three mysterious letters J, B, M, that the common initiates see in the Masonic temples, are reproduced in the meeting rooms of the Luciferians, but they no longer mean Jakin, Bohaz, Mahabon, as in the lodges, nor Jacques Bourguignon Mole, as with the Knights Kadosh, in Theurgy these three letters mean, Jesus Bethlehem Midas Maledictus. Theurgy is therefore pure Satanism. Five inches moreover it is important to note that the Kabbalists, admitted to the mysteries of Theurgy, never mention the word Satan. They look upon certain dissident adepts who invoketh devil under the name of Satan as heretics, whose system they call goity or black magic. They call their own practices theurgy or white magic. Six between these two types of devil worshippers, the Luciferian occultists and the Satanists, there is a difference which must not be overlooked. Luciferians never call their infernal master spirit of evil or father and creator of crime. Albert Pike even forbade the use of the word Satan under any circumstances. There is indeed a distinction between the Satanists and Luciferians. The Satanists, described by Mr. Hausmans in his book, Let Boss, are chiefly persons mentally deranged by the use and abuse of drugs who, while suffering from a peculiar form of hysteria, accuse the god of Christians of having betrayed the cause of humanity. They are persons who recognize that their god Satan occupies a position in the supernatural sphere, inferior to that of the Christian deity. On the other hand the Luciferians or the initiates of kindred rites, while still laboring under a strange delusion, act deliberately and glorify Lucifer as the principle of good. To them he is the equal of the god of the Christian swam they describe as the principle of evil. It is necessary to recognize the distinction which exists between Luciferians and Satanists, for their two cults bear each other no resemblance, although Lucifer Satan manifests indiscriminately to his faithful followers of both denominations. One must not, however, imagine that the pride and satisfaction he derives from this adulation acts as an inducement to making him appear whenever he is called. Occultists of all schools agree that nothing is more capricious than the conduct of spirits when evoked. It is well moreover to remember that Luciferian occultism is no novelty, nor must one make the mistake of confusing it with ordinary Freemasonry, the lodges of which are only private clubs. Seven many authors have published books on Freemasonry, some printing the rituals, some their personal observations one certain facts, but few of these authors having themed self espoused into occult masonry, the real masonry of the Kabbalistic degrees which is in touch with all secret societies, Masonic as well as non-Masonic, have been able to state that Luciferian occultism controls Freemasonry. Though this is indeed the case, neither the President of the Council of the Order of the Grand Orient of France, the Supreme Chief of French Freemasonry, 
nor the President of the Supreme Council of Scottish Rights will be received at the meeting of a simple Luciferian ceremony just on account office title and dignity unless, at the same time, he possesses a diploma of Kabbalistic grade which requires another initiation. On the other hand, the first odd fellow from Canada, a member of the Chinese Sanho Huawei of China, a Luciferian fakir from India, all these can visit at their pleasure all lodges and inner shrines of ordinary Freemasonry in all countries because, in each one of the satanic sects, the directing authority is exercised by heads who belong to the most exalted Masonic degrees of the different rites, degrees which are for them of secondary importance. These chiefs, at the request of fear subordinates of the Luciferian societies, deliver to them freely the diplomas necessary to obtain admittance everywhere, as well as the sacred words and yearly and hey yearly passwords of all the Masonic rites of the globe. 8. Luciferian Occultism, as has been said before, is therefore no a novelty, but it bore a different name in the early days of Christianity. It was called Gnosticism and its founder was Simon the Magician. The Gnostics were not ordinary heretics but constituted an anti Christian sect. To deceive the multitude, they affected disagreement with certain doctrines of the apostles, and Thechifs selected from among the initiates those destined to receive, in secret council, the satanic revelation. Gnosticism is marked with the seal of Lucifer. It is contemporary with the Apostle Peter and has continued, without interruption down to the present day, periodically changing its mask, the seven founders of Freemasonry were all Gnostics, Magi of the English Rose Qua, whose names were, Theophile de Saguliers, named chaplain of the Prince of Wales by George II, Anderson, the clergyman, an Oxford graduate and preacher to the King of England, George Payne, James King, Calvert, London Madden, and Eliot. Gnosticism, as the mother of Freemasonry, has imposed its mark in the very center of the chief symbol of this association. The most conspicuous emblem which one notices on Interanga Masonic Temple, the one which figures on the seals, on their rituals, everywhere in fact, appears in the middle of the interlaced square and compass. It is the five pointed star framing the letter G. Different explanations of this letter G are given to the initiates. In the lower grades, one is taught that it signifies geometry. To the brothers frequenting the lodge submitting women as members, it is revealed that the mystic letter means generation, but the revelation is attended with great secrecy. Finally, T6 those found worthy to penetrate in Tothi sanctuary of Knights Kadosh, the enigmatic letter becomes the initial of the doctrine of the perfect initiates which is Gnosticism. This explanation is no longer an imaginary fabrication. It is Gnosticism which is the real meaning of G in the flamboyant star. For, after the grade of Kadosh, a Hebrew word meaning consecrated, the Freemasons dedicated themselves to the glorification of Gnosticism, or anti Christianity, which is defined by Albert Pike as the sole and marrow of Freemasonry. Let us add that the ancient mysteries of Gnosticism have been known and published in the past. There is no difference between the Gnosticism of the early ages of Christianity and modern occultism. The fundamental principle of Gnosticism was the double divinity, dual principle, and this is exactly the theological theory of modern occultism. The Gnostics claimed that the good God was Lucifer and that Christ was the devil, that what the Christians call vice was for them virtue, and to the Christian dogma they opposed Gnosticism. A word meaning human knowledge. Early Gnosticism had its doctors, the Basilideans, Ephites, and Valentinians. Basilide of Alexandria, one of them, lived at the end of the first century. He taught metempsychosis and the principles underlying present day theosophy. His system resembles that of the Spiritists of the 19th century who have invented nothing, for they copy Gnosticism even in its theory of the transmigration of souls. Basilide affirmed that he is the reincarnation of Plato. Whoever has penetrated into assemblies of modern theurgists can attest that one of its current theories is that of reincarnation. After Basilide came Montanus, who died in 212. Montanus was a grand master of the art of divination. The Bite of Mizraim, a Freemasonry said to be Egyptian, copies slavishly in its Kabbalistic grades, all the phantasmagoria of Montanus. This Gnostic doctor plunged himself into ecstasies and, according to history, he had two women, Maximilla and Priscilla, trained to act as his accomplices. 
the Gnostics came in crowds to admire their contortions worthy of epileptics. They had the sacred illness, ten and were considered two saints of Satan. In the assemblies of the sect, when they went into frenzies and prophesied, their oracular sayings were listened to with veneration by the adepts. Were they acting a part, were they just mediums or somnambulists, or were they what the Roman Catholics call possessed? This is a hard question to answer. A modern example of the influence exercised by occult organizations on the destinies of mankind is to be found in the history of the Holy Alliance, founded in 1815 by Alexander I, Emperor of Russia. This was originally a union of monarchs pledged to support the Christian Church and to stem the rising tide of radicalism, revolution, and subversion. In the Soir de la Maggie, p. 467, Eliphas Levi states that the spiritist sect of the rescuers of Louis XVI, wishing to penetrate this organization to use it for their own purposes, succeeded in insinuating one of their lumens into the good graces of the Tsar. This was Madame Bouche, known to the adepts as Sister Salome. After 18 months spent at the Russian court, during which she had many secret interviews with the emperor, she was supplanted by another medium somnambulist of the sect. The famous Madame de Krudner who acquired so great an influence over the Tsar that his ministers became alarmed at the situation thus created. Levi thus describes the fall of the favorite. One day, as the emperor was leaving her, she barred his passage crying God reveals to me that your life is in great danger. An assassin is in the palace. The emperor, alarmed, caused the palace to be searched and a man, armed with a dagger, was found. He confessed, when questioned that he had been introduced into the palace by Madame de Crudner herself. One wonders if the whole affair was not simply the result of a clever intrigue calculated to get rid of the prophetess. As such it was singularly successful for Madame de Crudner was summarily banished from the Russian court. In Della Maganeri Occult, pages 87 to 88, J. M. Reagan tells us that science counts four kinds of somnambulism, the natural, the symptomatic, the magnetic and the ecstatic. Natural and symptomatic somnambulism are two essentially different states, one occurring only at night, the other by day as well as by night. The conduct of the subject is different under the two conditions. Magnetic and ecstatic somnambulism differ from one another in so much as the one is commanded, willed, and the other is not. The first is artificial, the other natural. In the first, the subject is dependent, in the second, he acts independently. That is why induced somnambulism cures the natural when substituted for it. A lucid somnambulist bears no more resemblance to a man asleep than he does to an active man awake. When the Gnostics practiced magic, they evoked the spirits of the dead exactly as do the occultists of today. Dawning Christianity was prolific in miracles, so, in order to fight it, the disciples of Gnosticism had recourse to diabolical marvels. In this respect, are not contemporaneous spiritists, with their wrapping tables and apparitions, Gnostics under another name? Secret Gnostic meetings lead to depravity, as the adepts indulge in every kind of turpitude and obscenity, often under the influence of drugs such as Indian hemp, cannabis indica or opium, the medicinal properties of which, when administered under certain conditions, are provocative of mediumistic phenomena. Thus debauched, their moral sense weakened, initiate Sari Ridi to work. They work, they fall, and, as they fall the occult power grasps its prey. Their life, henceforth, is subject to the will of the hidden masters who, according to their secret designs, will lead their slaves to power, or a semblance of power, or else to their downfall. To use the words of inquire within and light bearers of darkness, p. 118. These masters, doubtless identical with the terrible power behind the horrors of Russia's sufferings and world revolution, have in reality no interest in soul or astral development, except as a means of forming passive illuminized tools, completely controlled in mind and actions. An inquire within further suggests that there is a group of flesh and blood men, who can form etheric links, from any distance with the leaders of these societies and who secretly work by means of that light which can slay or make alive common intoxicating, blinding, and, if need be, destroying unwary men and women, using them as instruments or light bearers to bring to pass this mad and evil scheme of world, dominion by the god people the Kabbalistic Jew. 
12 a further explanation of the phenomenon of induced mediumship is given us by the same author who quotes the following lines from Eliphas Levi's History of Magic, this may take place when, through a series of almost impossible exercises, our nervous system, having been habituated to all tensions and fatigues, has become a kind of living galvanic pile, capable of condensing and projecting powerfully that light, astral, which intoxicates and destroys. Inquire within comments further, it attempts to show that it leads to mastership and self-control, but on careful consideration it proves to be mere lie conscious mediumship inspired by crafty and willful deception, giving the adept a false confidence, inducing him to let go his physical senses and work upon the astral, where, enclosed by formulae given by these masters themselves, he is complete lie at their mercy. A recent practical illustration of these methods is the a teaching contained in a book Asia Mysteriosa by Zambhakiva, published by Dorbananya, which suggests ways and means of communication with the hidden masters. It will be recognized by anyone having taken an interest in the progress of science along certain lines that there is nothing impossible or even improbable in the suggestion that telepathy may be exploited by organizations for their own particular ends. Forty years ago William Gay Hudson wrote on telepathy as follows, If the power exists in man to convey a telepathic message to his fellow man, it presupposes the existence of, the power in the percipient to repeat the message to a third person and so on indefinitely, until someone receives it who has the power to elevate the information above the threshold of his consciousness, and thus convey it to the objective intelligence of the world. Nor is the element of time necessarily an adverse factor in the case, for there is no reason to suppose that such messages may not be transmitted from one to another for generations. Thus, the particulars of a tragedy might be revealed many years after the event, and in such a way as to render it difficult if not impossible, to receive the line through which the intelligence was transmitted. Fourth spirit is the easy and ever ready explanation of such a phenomenon is to ascribe it to the intervention of spirits of the dead. But to those who have kept pace with the developments of modern scientific investigation, and who are able to draw legitimate and necessary conclusions from the facts discovered, the explanation is obvious, without the necessity of entering the domain of the supernatural. 13 On the subject of hypnotism and crime, Hudson, riding further, reaches however a fatally false conclusion which for many years remained unchallenged. He states, p. 140, it is true that, on ordinary questions, the truth is always uppermost in the subjective mind. A hypnotic subject will often say, during the hypnotic sleep, that which he would not say in his waking moments. Nevertheless, he never betrays a vital secret. That this is true is presumptively proved by the fact that in all the years during which the science of hypnotism has been practiced, no one has ever been known to betray the secrets of any society or order. The attempt has often been made, but it has never succeeded. Hudson attributes this reticence to auto-suggestion, opposing the suggestion of another. This however is not the case, for, where a member of a secret society or order is concerned, that member was already hypnotized during initiation and it is not his will that guards the secret, it is the will of another, the will of the lodge. How many people know that hypnotism is about all there is to initiation? Hypnotism and fear. The rest is camouflage. In the event of this statement being doubted, we quote here with from Freemasonry Universal an article which needs no further comment. 14 The stewards prepare the candidate, the tiler first, and afterwards in turn the eye. G. Deacons and junior warden should inspect the candidate to see that everything is strictly correct. The preparation symbolizes poverty, blindness, or ignorance and poverty of spirit, but it may also signify a purification, i.e. that the riches and pleasures which bind one to the material side of life are discarded and the spirit blinded to their attractions. The bearing of the right arm, left breast, left knee and right heel being slipshod, are apparently a reference to the awakening of occult centers in one's being which may only become active when purification of the whole nature has begun. The very specific character of the preparation points to real knowledge of the occult physiology of the process of initiation on the part of those who originated the method which has been so faithfully preserved. Certain forces are sent through the candidate's body during the ceremony, 
especially at the moment when he is created, received and constituted an entered apprentice Freemason. Certain parts of the lodge have been very heavily charged with magnetic force, especially in order that the candidate may absorb as much as possible of this force. The first object of this curious method of preparation is to expose to this influence ethos various parts of the body which are especially used in the ceremony. In ancient Egypt, there was another reason for thesi preparations, for a weak current of physical electricity was sent through the candidate by means of a rod or sword with which it was touched at certain points. It is partly on this account that at this first initiation the candidate is deprived of all metal since they may very easily interfere with the flow of the currents. All kinds of nice inspiring symbolical interpretations of their ritual are generally given for the benefit of people who seem to win them, but it is here evident that the candidate, unknown to himself or herself, has acted throughout the ceremony of initiation under the stress of hypnotism. No longer a free agent. The initiate takes the oath under hypnotic force which, has also been used to instill into him the feeling of fear. Fear guards the secret of initiation, fear born under the power of hypnotism to serve henceforth as the controlling agent of the initiators over the initiated. The right worshipful master must be a genuine occultist, as it is up to him to charge, hypnotize, the candidate, for to give this in the words of Freemasonry Universal, the R. W. M. gives the light the pure white light of truth and illumination. 15 Illumination, alias Kundalini, alias Serpent Power, alias Electromagnetic Force, alias the Sex Force, etc. Even in our Western world anyone wishing to study Hatha Yoga can learn to neutralize the action of gravity and go some yards up in the air. This stunt, and the assumption of any size at will, are tricks for which training is essential, and if one works at it hard enough, one will eventually be able to mesmerize people for one's own purposes, business, political or other, thus following the lure of the occult to a sinister and i.e. black magic. 16 We will here observe that the miracles performed by Jesus Christ bore a distinctive feature, often overlooked, namely, that in every case altruism was the source of their inspiration. Thus they were a symbol of charity. This gives us the esoteric explanation of his silence when taunted on the cross. He saved others, himself he cannot save. Sooner than use this power for personal advantage Hecos death. Gnostic miracles, such as that have been buried alive for a period of time which constitutes the Hindu religious rites of Samadhi have no ulterior charitable purpose. They are chiefly performed for the object of creating wonderment curiosity or faith in magic, and as such, failing the altruistic motive, airy classifiable under the general term of black magic. As a stimulus to popular faith, they are, however, sanctioned by most pagan religions, though where such a custom prevails, the magical performers themselves are not privileged to withhold their gains for themselves, as these are acclaimed by the temple. Having dealt with the preliminaries of the subject, we will now proceed along the thorny paths of history, not the history of wars, battles, heroes, but that of the agents of their being. 